Good afternoon. I hope everybody's doing well. Uh, we had a slight malfunction with our technology this morning, so I'm going to record the sermon sitting at home in the palatial parsonage, and I hope you'll forgive me for not having this from the church this morning, uh, but we'll take care of the technical issues and we'll get it straight today. So, uh, In our scriptures today, we're in the book of Matthew, the fifth chapter, the 21st through 37th verses. Jesus is on the sermon, still preaching the Sermon on the Mount, and he says, You have heard that it was said to those who lived long ago, Don't commit murder. And all who commit murder will be in danger of judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with their brother or sister will be in danger of judgment. If they say to their brother or sister, You idiot! They will be in danger of being condemned by the governing council. And if they say, You fool! they will be in danger of fiery hell. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift at the altar and go. First, make things right with your brother or sister and then come back and offer your gift. Be sure to make friends quickly with your opponents while you are with them on the way to court. Otherwise, they will haul you before the judge. The judge will turn you over to the officer of the court, and you will be thrown in prison. I say to you in all seriousness that you won't get out of there until you have paid the last penny. You have heard it said, don't commit adultery. But I say to you that every man who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery in her heart, in his heart. And if your right eye causes you to fall into sin, tear it out and throw it away. It's better that you lose a part of your body than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to fall into sin, chop it off and throw it away. It's better that you lose a part of your body than that your whole body go into hell. It was said, whoever divorces his wife must give her a divorce certificate. But I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual unfaithfulness forces her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard it said that to those who lived long ago, don't make a false solemn pledge, but you should follow through on what you have pledged to the Lord. But I say to you that you must not pledge at all. You must not pledge by heaven because it's God's throne. You must not pledge by the earth because it's God's footstool. You must not pledge by Jerusalem because it's the city of the great king. And you must not pledge by your head because you can't turn one hair white or black. Let your yes mean yes and your no mean no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now if you will pray with me. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be holy and acceptable to you. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Before giving this sermon today, I want to warn you that we're going to be dealing with some very adult issues. Though they're tough to talk about, I feel it's very necessary that the church body hear these words from God. In today's lesson, Jesus gives the disciples four of six new laws that believers will need to follow to be in line with God's will. Though in actuality they may not be truly new because they are built on the laws already established by Moses. Jesus is adding some changes to help clarify what it means to live in community with one another. The four laws we will look at today are those regarding murder, adultery, marriage and divorce, and swearing oaths. There were once two members of a church congregation. Each worked in the same business, the same type of business. However, they were huge competitors of one another. Try as the young pastor of the church might to insulate his congregation from their bitterness, their business conflicts found their way into the church. 
It was especially evident during church council meetings with both squaring off in pitched battles across the tables. Sometimes the pastor had to cancel the meetings midway through to keep the two from coming to blows. Both men were talented members of the church and each served a necessary ministry at the church. But their petty arguments, name-calling, and threats were a cancer eating away at the congregation. The pastor had reached the point at which he had no answers as to how to end this battle, short of asking one or both of the men to leave the church. It had become that serious. As the pastor prayed that evening, he turned randomly in his Bible to our scripture lesson for today. His inspiration was found in verses 21 through 26. Jesus is addressing the people on the side of the mountain. And he says, you're familiar with the command to the ancients, do not murder. I'm telling you that anyone who is as much as angry with a brother or sister is guilty of murder. Carelessly call a brother an idiot, and you just might find yourself hauled into court. Thoughtlessly yell stupid at a sister, and you are on the brink of hellfire. The simple moral fact is that words kill. How seriously does Jesus take this issue of anger? With he, these words, he puts the people on notice that while under Mosaic law, murder and other extreme offenses place one under the penalty of death. As radical as it may sound, Jesus is now saying that even those who possess an angry temper will receive the same penalty. Anger if it is not righteous indignation and contempt, are incipient murder. Killing is not done by knives alone, but by contemptuous sneers and by the casual indifference that regards men as less than men, it says in the interpreter's Bible commentary. The pastor paused and thought, this sounds like our church, he read. Jesus continues addressing first century conflict resolution. This is how I want you to conduct yourself in these matters. If you enter a place of worship and about to make an offering, you suddenly remember a grudge a friend has against you, abandon your offering, leave immediately, go to this friend and make things right. Then, and only then, come back and work things out with God. Or say that you're out on the street and an old enemy accosts you. Don't lose a minute. Make the first move. Make things right with him. After all, if you leave the first move to him, knowing his track record, you're likely to end up in court, maybe even jail. And if that happens, you won't get out without a stiff fine. And again, the thought of abandoning a church service in the middle of making an offering to God, that seems a little radical. Jesus understands, however, that doing so allows the worshiper to, to be pure in his worship. It is not a deprecation of worship. It is rather an exaltation of worship. For God sees the inmost motive, and he must be worshipped in truth. A heart that is bitter with the poison of anger cannot offer adoration to God. There's just something that I can do to fix this conflict, the pastor thought. But what can I do? I'm young, inexperienced. These gentlemen have been at this forever, and there's no way they're ever going to talk. Even if I shut them up in a room and lock the door, one would probably kill the other. The pastor prayed for a solution and then drifted off to a restless sleep. As the pastor worked preparing Sunday's worship service, he had an idea. This Sunday, church was going to celebrate communion. The sanctuary was a large one, as was the congregation. It was large enough that when it came time for the communion, the pastor had to enlist the aid of other members of the congregation. He decided to ask one of the two quarreling men to assist him. Now, during the point in the service when the Lord's Supper was to be celebrated, the pastor slyly placed one of the men to his left the same side on which his adversary sat in the sanctuary. You see, though the young pastor was young and inexperienced, he understood that it's hard to, say, to stay mad at someone. 
And it's hard to continue pursuing conflict when you offer the words of reconciliation in the communion liturgy, the body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ poured out for you. This is something we may find hard to understand, right? We never have any of these conflicts here at Clinchfield, do we? The truth of the matter is we all understand it too well. Because when you are in community with other people, you are inevitably in conflict. Conflict is almost impossible to avoid in a world that thrives on it. Oftentimes, our very jobs are built on the conflict, like the two men in the story. Businesses create such a competitive environment because the owners of the business want to make more money than the average person couldn't dream of in their wildest dreams. Here's a scary fact. Did you know that in the United States, 40% of all of the wealth is controlled by only 1% of the population? Those same people bring home nearly a quarter of the national income today. In 1976, that same 1% only brought home 9% of that income. Scarier still, the lower 80% of the population, which includes the poor and the middle class, share only 7% of the nation's wealth. And guess where the rest goes? To the rich. How do we get away with this? How do we get this way? By making an idol of money and by greedily chasing after it to the exclusion of everything else, we turned our backs on the peace-loving God of our creation and turned instead to the conflict-loving tempter. It's no wonder, it's no wonder, is it, that so much of Jesus' ministry was consumed by speeches against the wealthy. When we all seek after these things that we shouldn't in search of pleasing ourselves instead of pleasing God, conflict will almost assuredly arise, especially with the ones to whom we are closest. Pleasing ourselves was directly confronted by Jesus in the next words from the Sermon on the Mount. You know the next commandment pretty well, too. Don't go to bed with another spouse, he said. But don't think you preserved your virtue by simply staying out of bed. Your heart can be corrupted by lust even quicker than your body. Those leering looks you think nobody notices, they're also corrupt. In the 2008 movie Fireproof, actor Kirk Cameron's character Caleb Holt thinks nothing of viewing intimate pictures via the internet. Though he covers up his habit, Caleb's addiction to the internet pornography is definitely harming his marriage to his wife Catherine to the point that some Harmless flirting with a doctor almost leads her into an extramarital affair. It is only after Caleb turns back to God, walks away from his addiction, and begins to focus only on God, that the pieces of his shattered life and marriage are salvaged. There are a multitude of Bible stories that tackle the subject of lust and adultery. Even the greatest king in the Bible, David, was subject to this temptation when he saw Bathsheba bathing on the rooftop in 2 Samuel 11, David couldn't take his eyes off her. He knew it was wrong, but lust simply overtook him with murderous ferocity. As, re as written recently in a popular song by Christian contemporary stars Casting Crowns, be careful, little eyes, what you see. It's the second glance that ties your hands as darkness pulls the strings. You see, lust can affect anyone, from the powerless to the powerful. President Jimmy Carter even admitted that he had lusted after other women. While men offer suffer from the stigma of being addicted to internet porn, women aren't immune either. Listen to these statistics released in an article from 2013. According to a study published in the Journal of Adolescent Research, about one half, 49% of young adult women, agree that viewing pornography is an acceptable way of expressing one's sexuality. And about one in five women, 18%, use the internet for sexual purposes habitually every week. It's not easy to resist temptations of the flesh, 
So vile is this sin that Jesus' response to the issue of adultery sounds fairly radical. Let's not pretend this is easier than it really is, he says. If you want to live a morally pure life, here's what you have to do. You have to blind your right eye the moment you catch it in a lustful leer. You have to choose to live one-eyed or else be dumped on a moral trash pile. And you have to chop off your right hand the moment you noticed it raised threateningly. Better a bloody stump than your entire being discarded for good in the dump. Now, of course, Jesus isn't truly advocating self-mutilation, for in reality, even if one did chop off his right hand or pluck out his right eye, the desire to sin would remain behind. But the language Jesus uses shows the seriousness with which the call to discipleship must be taken. It is a metaphorical pruning of the body in order for the soul to produce good fruit. And now Jesus turned his eyes to the subject of divorce. Jesus says, Remember the scripture that says, Whoever divorces his wife, let him do it legally, giving her divorce papers and her legal rights. Too many of you are using that as a cover for selfishness and whim, pretending to be righteous just because you are, quote, legal. Please, no more pretending. If you divorce your wife, you're responsible for making her an adulteress, unless she has already made herself that by sexual promiscuity. And if you marry such a divorced adulteress, you're automatically an adulterer yourself. You can't use legal cover to mask a moral failure. In Jesus' time, just as it is in our own, people were beginning to think of marriage as something that was disposable. Moses, in Deuteronomy 24, issued a law that allowed a man to divorce his wife because he had discovered something inappropriate about her. Even before Moses gave his ruling on divorce, man stepped outside the bounds of marriage as God had prescribed in Genesis with the relationship of Adam and Eve. Soon after leaving the, leaving the Garden of Eden, husbands began to marry multiple wives, and stories of adultery and prostitution began to emerge marriages became disposable. To Jesus, God's marriage plan was spelled out with Adam and Eve. The two will become one flesh. Jesus says the bond of marriage is inseparable. Divorce, therefore, was unacceptable. His very restrictive stand against divorce is brought about by his understanding of what is more often than not the actual motive behind the divorce, the desire simply to marry another. Usually this desire is brought on by lust, which is a violation of not Moses' law, but God's law. Therefore, Jesus declares that divorce for any reason is against God's law in case, except in the case, of abuse. A strong marriage meant a strong family. A strong family meant a strong community. Divorce would not only damage and harm the couple, but it would weaken their family and the whole community as well. Divorce usually meant sin was involved, and in order for his people to be in his kingdom, there was no room for sin, and therefore, no room for divorce. Finally today, Jesus issues a new law regarding making an oath. This issue was precipitated by controversy that constantly was raised by the rabbis of the time. These rabbis were arguing over the third and fourth commandments. The third, you shall not take the norm of name of the Lord thy God in vain. And the ninth, you shall not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Both dealt with being truthful. The rabbis argued that if a man added, I swear, to any statement that he made, that that made the statement of truth and therefore constituted an oath. And don't say anything you don't mean, Jesus said. This counsel is embedded deep in our traditions. You only make things worse when you lay down a smoke screen of pious talk saying, I'll pray for you and never doing it, or saying, God be with you and not meaning it. You don't make your words true by embellishing them with religious lace. 
In making your speech sound more religious, it becomes less true. Just say yes and no. When you manipulate words to get your way, you go wrong. Jesus contended that the oaths were used only because people had become so accustomed to telling lies. Truthfulness had gotten buried deep in the dung heap of sin. Lies breed more lies in an intricate web until everything they touch is affected. Telling the truth means staying within the will of God. There is no need to swear an oath as long as you remain truthful to God. Words are powerful and truthful words are even more so. In adding a prohibition against oaths, Jesus is insisting that society cannot stand and God cannot be honored except by truth on the lips and truth in the heart. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. So what does it all mean? In essence, the meaning for us all is that Jesus wants his disciples to be people of integrity, people who are faithful to their promises, such as a marriage decree, people who need no need to swear that they are telling the truth because they are truth tellers. They should be people who honor their commitments in marriage and who respect the commitments of other. The women in their midst are not the people to be used and abandoned at will but they are fellow disciples. They are among the ones who are now blessed by God's reign. For we as a church, to claim Jesus' message of God's kingdom come, we as disciples must strive to be the kind of place that indeed reflects God's reign. Be truthful. Be honest. Let your yes be yes and your no mean no. Amen. I hope you've enjoyed this message today, and I look forward to seeing you all at worship next Sunday. Those of you who will be at Disciple uh, Fast Track tonight, I look forward to seeing you. The youth will see you this evening as well. And the rest of you that are on the church council, I hope to see you tomorrow night at our council meeting at 6 o'clock. And we will meet in the sanctuary of the church. Thank you and God bless.